Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Good afternoon. The boss of Jaguar Land Rover has issued a stark warning over the dangers of a bad Brexit, telling Sky News it could put tens of thousands of jobs at risk. Speaking to Sky's Ian King, Ralph Speth said his firm relies on a free and frictionless supply chain and said no one benefits from Britain's departure from the EU, whether it's a hard Brexit or not. To what extent are your investment decisions on electric vehicles and parts for electric vehicles going to be impacted by Brexit? It's quite clear that Brexit is a challenge, but I am hopeful that at the end of the day, both sides of the channel, in continental Europe but also in the UK, the politicians will find the right approach so that the economy can prosper, that we fight for chops again. You said in July that a bad Brexit deal, as you termed it, would cost you £1.2 billion. Is that still your view? Yes, it is. And by the way, it's quite open. Everybody can calculate this kind of figure. And by the way, £1.2 billion only means just for Czech Land Rover without any burden of the supply industry. And so it's a huge figure and it's really a challenge for Czech Land Rover. At the end of the day, that ten, ten thousands of people are on risk if we don't find a good solution, the right solution for Brexit. Well, the Prime Minister has been speaking in the last half an hour and said the Chequers proposals will allow for frictionless trade in the car manufacturing industry. We have agreed with the European Union that smooth transition through the implementation period and we're working with them to develop the future relationship, a future economic partnership. As we set out our proposals in the Chequers plan, those proposals provide for frictionless trade, they provide for ensuring that the important industries, like the car industry, that I've heard from today here in the West Midlands, the automotive industry, very clear, they want to see frictionless trade. We've put proposals for that uh, forward in the Chequers plan. In a moment, we'll be live in Westminster with our political editor, Faisal Islam. But first, let's go to our city studio and Ian King, who's been speaking to the boss of Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, and Ian, he didn't mince his words. Quite uh, depressing, his uh, predictions there. That's right. I mean, Ralph Speth has been uh, quite fairly vocal over the last couple of years on uh, the implications of a hard Brexit for his business, in common with other member uh, senior figures from the car industry. But I think this is probably his starkest warning to date. JLR, of course, massive UK manufacturing success story. Britain's biggest car manufacturer by far. It accounts for almost one in three cars produced here in the UK. And the po key point that Ralph Speth getting to me there was that they rely on what's known as just-in-time supply chains. In other words, components, when they arrive at their plants, they are very, very quickly incorporated into the manufacturing process. And if you get supply bottlenecks, for example, with customs checks at the border, well, that very quickly throws a spanner in the works and holds up their production. And to put some figures on that for you, Gillian, well, the largest plant operated by JLR here in the UK, in Solihull, it produces around 1,500 cars a day using 15 million components. So you can see very quickly how if they did get supply chain bottlenecks, how that would impact on production. And that's where he gets this figure uh, in, of £1.2 billion in lost pro profits, because closing the pro operation, the product production for just one day would cost them £60 million. So Ralph Speth, very, very anxious about this. Um, he's quite keen to see the Chequers deal uh, voted through. As uh, you heard there from the Prime Minister, that the uh, Chequers deal is all about reducing frictionless trade. And I said, well, what message would you have for Theresa May's own MPs in the Conservative Party who are against Chequers? And he said, quite simply, think about those people who work in manufacturing. And I asked him uh, what he thought about some of the other proposals made by the uh, Brexiteers, particularly those opponents of the Chequers proposal, and he said, well, actually, they haven't really come up with any alternatives. So you can see there a very, very major UK investor indeed. JLR's invested £50 billion in the UK over the last five years. It's looking to invest a further £80 billion over the next five. You can see that he's getting pretty ticked off with the uh, way the Brexit process is going.
In, thank you. Well, let's bring in our political editor now, Faisal Islam. And Faisal, uh, very clearly there, the Prime Minister saying that the Chequers deal would be uh, good news for the car industry. Yes, uh, in that interview clip. But I was quite struck that in the speech that immediately followed Ralph Speth saying uh, some very strong words from the lectern, the Prime Minister didn't choose to really sell checkers to, to, to that audience. Uh, we have just had a readout from a private meeting that she has had with the car industry where she did in fact do that, said that the frictionless trade which they enjoy, which has been described there by Ian King, this just-in-time swapping of parts from a, uh, around the continent, uh, that that under her deal, if she can get it signed off by Europe, which is still a big ask, if she can get it through Parliament, that that does provide some sort of route to protect uh, the way in which the car industry uh, acts uh, right now and functions uh, uh, and to have the chief exec of the United Kingdom's biggest car manufacturer say that they would not be able to build cars if the motorway to and from Dover becomes a car park, saying that tens of thousands of jobs could be put at risk if we don't get the right Brexit deal is, uh, well, extraordinary from one uh, hand, totally predictable from others who uh, are looking at where this is going. Uh, but I do think you'll see perhaps Number 10 trying to use these sorts of warnings to try to say to some of those Brexit to backbenchers who are launching their own report saying that no deal would not just be fine but would lead to a boost in the economy worth two and a half thousand pounds for every family over 15 years uh, to come up with their own plan for how they would protect the car industry. Indeed, I interviewed uh, Jacob uh, Rees-Mogg a little bit around the time those comments came out and uh, you know, I put to him, what does he know uh, about uh, Ralph Speth's JLR business uh, how does he know more than him about that business? And, uh, you know, they say, well, the car industry will be fine because essentially the German car industry needs to sell more to us than we need to them. It, well, it looks like the car industry itself says that doesn't function as an argument. It might function as an argument in terms of finished cars arriving to and fro from the United Kingdom and Europe, doesn't in terms of the way in which the cars uh, are made. Uh, and that is an argument that they are yet uh, to defeat fully. Made pretty strongly there by our our biggest car manufacturer uh, and to some degree backed up by Theresa May. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? She can't quite go full throttle on this. She can say, yes, no deal might be bad and threaten the car industry because we want frictionless trade, but she doesn't seem to want to get fully involved in the argument that the car industry may be in some sort of danger from a no deal. That's the implication of what she says. She doesn't spell it out fully. OK, Faisal, thank you. Meanwhile, the Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has had his contract extended by seven months, the Chancellor confirmed today, to handle the aftermath of Brexit. Mr Carney said he was willing to do whatever he could to promote a successful Brexit. I have been uh, discussing with the Governor uh, his ability uh, to be able to serve a little longer in post in order to ensure continuity through what could be quite a uh, turbulent period for our economy uh, in the early summer of 2019. And that angered Brexiteers. Nigel Farage called the decision truly appalling. Also at Westminster, the Economist for Free Trade Group, backed by Brexit MPs, said people shouldn't fear leaving the EU with no deal. Britain could prosper, they said, under World Trade Organization rules. The Treasury was wrong. It's been consistently wrong. Do you remember we were going to have a punishment budget? That never happened. And economists for free trade have a consistent record of being accurate, so that's why I back them uh, rather than the phony forecasts of the Treasury. But Philip Hammond rubbished the economist leader, Patrick Minford. I'm afraid I find, um, I'm sure his model is very effective, but the assumptions that he makes are wildly out of line um, with assumptions that are used by other economic uh, modelers and um, frankly uh, I believe are not uh, sustainable. Now Rotterdam in the Netherlands is the biggest port in Europe and a significant amount of its shipping ends up on these shores in Britain. In the city the prospect of a no-deal Brexit is alarming a number of businesses. Some have warned they'll face more than four times the paperwork. Shipments could take five times as long to process and fresh produce will no longer be fresh. Our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy, is in Rotterdam. Siobhan.
Well, John, this is so far we've only heard about potential Brexit log jams from British ports like Dover and Immingham. This is the first time a European port has sounded the alarm bell, and that's important because Rotterdam is Europe's largest port, all 25 miles of it, John. Think of a single port that stretches from Dover to Calais, and you get the sense of scale here. And their message today is simple. We're preparing. We believe that we can be ready but we're worried about everybody else. From crop to shop, millions of these Dutch tomatoes are bound for Britain every day. They're hurriedly packing boxes for the 2 p.m. sailing. So-called just-in-time production guarantees the fresh food here appears in British supermarkets the next day. The journey of the humble tomato, just one example of the deeply integrated food chain that's threatened by the UK breaking its links with the EU. As politicians in Westminster squabble over what type of Brexit they will or won't sign up to, it's on factory floors like this in Holland where their decisions will be most acutely felt. About a third of these tomatoes end up in British supermarkets, from the vine to the shelf in just 12 hours. It's a slick operation that's worked for decades. So any delay, or worse still, no Brexit deal at all, could halt this process in its tracks. The tomatoes end up here, with more than 40 different fruit, veg and flowers at the Dutch logistics company Daily Fresh. Twice a day in a frenzied hour, the warehouse empties onto lorries, only bound for Britain. If there's a no deal, the boss, Nicole Visbeen, warns the process could take up to five hours with extra paperwork and physical checks. We have trailers with 20 deliveries, so if they have to check every delivery with different produce, every pellet, it will be a disaster. And, and are you any closer to knowing if that is what's going to happen or not going to happen? No, we don't know anything, so we're, we're trying to investigate what will be the best part to do, but we don't know what to do. Not what Aldi, Morrisons and Lidl, three of her biggest customers, would want to hear. Produce from this warehouse is delivered to 380 destinations up and down the UK. But delays would hurt this company and the Dutch economy just as much. I think we are even more worried because we know how many pallets, how many produce we are shipping every day. We're shipping 120 trailers full with produce every day. And a lot of people, I think, in the UK don't understand what's coming in. For now, though, it's a seamless journey. And so it should be when the process goes out through Europe's biggest state-of-the-art port, Rotterdam. But while the trade here may be plain sailing, they're worried Brexit won't be. That's why they brought British press here today, because, as the customs chief puts it, he's preparing, but fears no one else is. There will always be uh, a difference between trading in the EU and from outside the EU. That's, that's the essence of Brexit. You want to leave the internal market, so there will be friction. Um, Will there be a lot of friction? Depends. If people trade, prepare for it, the friction can be reduced. If they don't? Then there's friction. Only from the water do you get a sense of how colossal these ships are and how huge is the port of Rotterdam, 25 miles long. In fact, more than 10% of the freight here ends up in the UK. So getting a good Brexit deal is as important for them as it is for us. Right now, goods to and from the UK sail through customs, and that will continue if Theresa May's checkers deal goes through. But in the likely event it doesn't, for each shipment, there'll be nine separate declarations, not to mention lengthy food and livestock checks, something the inspections boss admits they're not ready for. So, in a worst case scenario, what does it look like? Worst case scenario is that uh, there are no inspection facilities for certain goods, for, for example, live animals. Uh, and the other thing is that it's an enormous amount of extra work we have to do. Uh, we think about an increase of 30% of import controls and 100% of export controls. But you're in charge of those inspections. Is it not worrying for you? Well, if there's no inspection location, I cannot do any inspections. So. 
typically Dutch and direct, as they are about the need for more than a thousand new staff to cope. As the Brexit supertanker ploughs on, though, the British government will hope that uncertainty here and across Europe will strengthen its hand in negotiations. But negotiating, just like sea trade, is two-way traffic. Siobhan Kennedy, Channel 4 News in Rotterdam. And from Rotterdam and from here in Manchester at the Trades Union Congress, that's all from us tonight. Now back to Jackie in London. Thanks, John. Well, the Prime Minister was taken to task over Brexit today by the boss of one of Britain's biggest car manufacturers, Ralph Spate, the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover, said a hard Brexit could cost tens of thousands of jobs in his industry. Speaking in Birmingham, where the PM was pledging support for zero emission vehicles, he said without the right deal, there'd be no guarantee his company's plants would continue production in the UK. I caught up with him at the event to ask him what a no deal would cost. At the moment, I guess nobody can really define how a no deal Brexit is going to look like. Can we expand the current, let's say, regulation schemes? Or do we expect totally new ones? Now, if you calculate according to WTO, then it's quite clear. The elements are open and everybody can do the math. And just for Czech Land Rover, it would mean that we wipe out 1.2 billion annually from our profit. And that's money we eagerly need to invest in the future, to invest in better solutions for the environment but also for the people. But what would that mean then for your investment levels in terms of numbers? What would it mean? There's no investment anymore, there's no research anymore, because at the end of the day, with this kind of burden, there's no liquidity anymore. So if there's no investment, are you saying you would have to, for example, move production out of the UK? That might be one of the consequences, but uh, it quite clear has to be prepared very, very quickly. But is that a possibility, do you think? Overall, you know, we are a British company and our heart is in Britain. Our complete research is in Britain. Your heart may say you want to stay in the UK, but what does your business head say? Uh, at the end of the day, my business uh, then will say nothing anymore because with this kind of burden, uh, we will go in liquidity. And thousands and ten thousands are chopped of chops are on risk. So Theresa May has made it quite clear that she believes the best solution is her checkers deal, that it's the only deal in town. Do you agree? Is it the best deal for Jaguar Land Rover? At the end of the day, it's a question not about Jaguar Land Rover on its own, it's a question about manufacturing and the export industry. And that means at the end of the day, industry and trade need free, frictionless, seamless trade in between countries in addition the skills so that we can really prosper and that we can give something back to the communities but do you think the checkers deal secures that in any way i think the checkers deal is indeed a very good basis to start from but it's also quite clear they are sitting a lot of countries around the table and so it has to be defined what will be the right deal and i only can recommend that we need a free, frictionless, fair, open deal. In practical terms, your industry relies so heavily on that free and frictionless trade. You know, trucks are delivering parts crisscrossing between Europe and the UK all the time. Without that free and frictionless trade, what happens on a practical basis to your company? At the end of the day, if you have a problem in between just only the border at Dover with traffic from and to Dover, that means we would have a problem. We produce around about 3,000 vehicles in the UK and we need around about 25 million parts. And if, the, if there's anything in between, that would mean our, uh, let's say, overall logistics just in time would see problems. And that would be a huge challenge to overcome. I can hear pro-Brexit ministers saying this is still project fear this is talking down britain shouldn't you be more ambitious about new and bigger global markets for your company we are delivering vehicles in more than 150 uh, countries around the world 
And yes, we have to be, because all of this production is, we have to be closer to the customers. But at the end of the day, I'm also quite she, uh, sure that the politicians in the UK, but also in continental Europe, will find the best solution for business. Ralph Spate, the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover, speaking to me earlier. Now let's stay with Brexit because Britain's biggest car maker says it doesn't know yet if its factories will be able to operate the day after Brexit. The warning from Jaguar Land Rover is the starkest yet from an industry really at the heart of those Brexit negotiations. The company is concerned about friction at borders and the leading Brexiteer, Jacob Rees-Mogg, well, he has admitted to Sky News there would be delays, but he said they'd be minimal and he's backed a report predicting a trillion pound Brexit bounty. Here's our political editor, Faisal Islam, to explain. The Road to Zero attempts by number 10 to send a message about long-term exciting opportunities for Britain, this time on electrifying the nation's cars. A chance for the Prime Minister to meet top car executives. Now, I want to see Britain at the forefront of the next revolution in transport. But the emissions from the industry at the same event were pretty toxic. The chief of Britain's top car manufacturer, Jaguar Land Rover, making a big Brexit warning. Brexit is due to happen on the 29th of March next year. Currently, I do not even know if any of our manufacturing facilities in the UK will be able to function on the 30th. Like many British companies, our supply chains reach deep into Europe. Bluntly, we will not be able to build cars if the motorway to and from Dover becomes a car park. He said the government's vision of an electric car future at risk because of Brexit, but no mention of that or of checkers from the Prime Minister. Others more than willing to step into the vacuum of selling their Brexit ideas, if not a full plan. Back in Westminster, away from the TV cameras, Jacob Rees-Mogg launching a report backed by Boris Johnson, claiming no deal would boost family incomes by over £2,000 in a decade and a half and an admission that Brexit does mean the end of frictionless trade. Jaguar Land Rover has done extremely well trading on world trade uh, basis. Most of its exports are not to the European so Union. So why don't they back your no deal? Right. They're terrified of your no deal. They, they well, that's, that's, a question, that's a question for them. But uh, what is it, 21% of their exports to the European Union, of their sales to the European Union? Well, half of their parts, 40, um, 40 to 50% uh, of their parts. Coming in. Yeah. But who says we're going to clog up the port? In leaving the EU, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, we won't have frictionless trade. Yes, that's right. That is correct. We yes. won't have, so there will be an impact on some industries that have been built but, up on frictionless well, trade. That's the logic. But you can have very limited friction. But also speaking to Sky News, the Jaguar chief said the warnings were very real. 1.2 billion only means just for Jaguar Land Rover without any burden of the supplier industry. Ten thousands of people are on risk if we don't find a good solution, the right solution for Brexit. It is a big week for no deal preparations. Sky News obtained internal documents showing plans for aviation involving the reissuance of pilot's licenses and a push to acquire air safety skills. Sky sources also confirmed that Transport Secretary Chris Grayling has written to all of the 27 EU members suggesting bilateral arrangements to cover no deal and keep planes in the skies. More no deal notices and a special cabinet meeting due on Thursday as the internal conservative arguments over Brexit continue. Faisal Islam, Sky News. Well, the car industry isn't the only sector sounding a warning. A banker with one of the city's biggest names says thousands more jobs at his firm alone could leave London in the coming months. But car plants are particularly susceptible to problems at the border, as Sky's Tom Parmenton now reports. The great transport revolution of the 21st century is already happening. Electric power may not sound the same, but at Sieta in Oxfordshire, they're convinced that high-powered motorbikes can be just as much fun. Their Dutch CEO is as ambitious as they come, but feeling more and more alienated by Brexit. When I now talk to my network on the continent, people are turning around and like, well, you're in the UK. Um, we're not going to invest 
it's, it's, let's see where this ends up. So even on the investment side, um, people are now refraining from putting money into the UK, which is, which is crazy, really. A third of the small workforce here have made the UK their home to push the zero emission technology. This should be the best of times for this sector, full of possibilities, but uncertainty over Brexit, the idea even of a no deal, means that it was characterised today as potentially the worst of times. Brexiteers say that's just more scaremongering. All ministers can do is hope to strike a trade deal with the EU this autumn. We're working to make sure that we provide the smoothest possible transition, whatever the circumstance. Uh, we're doing detailed contingency planning in case there is no deal at the end of it. But I don't think that's going to happen. I don't believe that's going to happen. We're confident we'll reach a place that gives everyone comfort and secures a smooth transition. It's not just the automotive industry. The banking group JP Morgan has already started moving hundreds of staff out of the UK and are looking at a scenario where the number is in the thousands. What we do know is these are the numbers today, but it will be difficult to speculate what they might be in the future. And one could envisage a scenario where those numbers could be substantially larger. The captains of these industries say they're not trying to tinker with democracy. They're trying to tell it as they see it. The next six months are pivotal and could dictate, in their view, the pace of possibility. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, Oxfordshire. Now, after all the arguing and animosity over Brexit in Conservative quarters in the past few days, uh, the whole issue reached a new level of danger for the Prime Minister this evening. Her leadership was the main issue at a meeting of Jacob Rees-Mogg's European Reform Group, with around 50 or so MPs apparently openly talking about ways of removing Mrs May. We'll have more on that breaking story in a moment from our political editor, Robert Peston, who has just come in here with the details. But let's set it all up with Paul Brand's account of Theresa May's attempts to woo them today. For the second time this week, MPs arrived in Downing Street for something they can't stomach. Another free dinner for those refusing to swallow the checkers plan. Can you be wined and dined into backing checkers? No, I think checkers is a very foolish idea and I will be explaining why there are many better options. How many glasses of wine would it take for you to back checkers? I, I wouldn't back checkers if, uh, if they gave me the whole wine cellar. There was one Brexit deal the government did manage to do today, extending Mark Carney's contract as Governor of the Bank of England till 2020. The Chancellor said that had smoothed Brexit, but it roughed up his critics, who thought once again this sounded too negative. I have been uh, discussing with the Governor uh, his ability uh, to be able to serve a little longer in post in order to ensure continuity through what could be quite a uh, turbulent period for our economy uh, in the early summer of 2019. That left the Prime Minister steering the message back on track, promising Brexit would be a gentle ride. Yes, we're coming out of the EU on the 29th of March next year, but we have agreed uh, the withdrawal agreement and our future relationship and implementation period that means a smooth transition. Is the Chequers deal dead, do you think, today? But with all eyes on what he's running for, Today, Boris Johnson attacked the Prime Minister's plan as worse than what we have now. Joining a meeting of other Brexiters, racking their brains for a better idea as they presented their own economic forecasts, claiming no deal would make Britain a trillion pounds richer. You are saying, don't trust their economists, trust our economists. Why should we? Who should we believe? What I'm saying is look at experience and don't believe the scare stories because some of the scare stories are just not true. The idea that food prices will go up. No, they won't because we will be in charge of our tariffs and the government is not going to punish the electorate by putting up food prices. But we should be believe to... your st stories about a trillion pounds extra. Well, that's over 15 years. That's an estimate of the benefits of free trade. And in the last few minutes, dinner doesn't seem to have gone down well. Well, we were discussing leadership. Hey, did the dinner and wine help? Discussing With the support? Leadership issues. Don't worry. Which leadership is usually discussing? You guess. Is that a hint tonight that it's not just her plan MPs are plotting to ditch, but the Prime Minister herself? Paul Brandt, News at 10, Westminster. Uh, and as I, said, as I said just a moment ago, Robert has hot-footed it in here with the story. So give us an account of what happened tonight. So the European Research Group, as you pointed out, the uh, group led by Jacob Rees-Mogg and Steve Baker, had their annual weekly meeting. Now, 
We know that the Brexiters in that group are not happy with the Prime Minister, but something happened tonight that has not happened before, which is the entire discussion over about 50 minutes from 50-odd MPs was all about how to get rid of the Prime Minister. And the reason that those present say this is remarkable is not just because it's never happened before in their weekly meeting, it's a semi-public meeting. The whips snuck in mm. uh, to listen to what was going on. So this was broadly her own backbenchers saying very openly she has got to go, and more than that, discussing the tactics of how she goes. You'll be aware, Tom, that in order for there to be a vote of no confidence, the chairman of the Backbench 1922 committee has to receive 48 letters mm -hmm. from Tory MPs saying that they are no longer happy in her leadership of the Tory party. It's thought that something like 36 letters have already gone in. Frankly, if uh, this meeting is well. carried yeah. through, if, this, if what was said in the meeting is carried through into more letters, they'll easily get the 50, the okay. 48. And so at that point, there has to be a vote of confidence. There has to be Will a vote in it? whether she continues. In your view, if it comes to a vote of confidence, if they get the letters, well, first of all, do you think they will get the 48? And secondly, do you think if there is a vote of confidence, she'll win it? So, I think there are sort of two things we have to assess here. One is, in terms of her credibility, people openly discussing how much yeah, they wanted to go I grant is you. terrible, yeah, yeah. right? Many leaders would simply say, I've had enough on this basis. But we know that she's a fighter and mm. she's signalled that she won't go unless there's a very big vote against her. In fact, her people have said unless she loses that election, yeah. she's not going to go. And nobody really believes that. Most people believe that if there were 100 mm. protest votes against her, she would have to go. Mm. Now... You said, will the, will the letters go in? I think there's now a, a very, very good chance that during the autumn they will go in. Will she get to the 100 plus? The charm offensive that her people are running at the moment, Robbie Gibber, Director of Communications, Gavin Barwell, mm. uh, her Chief of Staff, is not going down well. They're having these dinners with Brexiters and their basic message is, I know you don't like her checkers plan. I know you don't like her proposals for a future relationship. But the important thing is just to get us out and we can all sort it out later. For many Brexiters mm. who've had experience that the EU never sorts things out later, they hate that message. OK, well, it's evolving as we speak, so let's see where we end up. Um, now, while Conservative MPs have been arguing like mad about Brexit since they went back to work last week, the wheels of the European Parliament only started turning again today after their summer break. The Brexit deal the UK ends up with, if there is one, has to be ratified, of course, by MEPs. So what they think is crucial. They're always very friendly to us. What could possibly go wrong? At the European Parliament, unlike Westminster, it is not all Brexit all of the time. Indeed, today they were tackling the tricky subject of whether to take action against the government of Viktor Orban in Hungary for what Brussels believes are his repeated breaches of Europe's democratic standards. The Greek Prime Minister in town with plenty on his own plate was not alone in feeling irritated at being asked yet again about you know what. The only critical question for you is Brexit, but it's not only Brexit our problem, you know. But with just 199 days to go, it can hardly be avoided. There are very faint signs of movement from this end, with increasing talk of fudge and vague statements of intent to get Brexit over the line in March. Many in London may welcome that, though the official line from one of the most senior members of the Cabinet is that some stuff must be nailed down now. What I get from members of the European Parliament is we need to know where you, the UK, are transitioning to. So I think it's going to be important that we have, alongside the withdrawal agreement legal text, a political declaration about what our destination is going to detailed be. Detailed political to. declaration. It's got, it's got to have enough clarity. It is not going to be a detailed legal document. But time is tight to get that clarity. EU leaders meet in Salzburg next week and will agree another special summit on Brexit for November. That will be make or break.
By then, the view is, time really will have run out, because a deal must be ratified both at Westminster and the European Parliament to be ready for the 29th of March next year, Brexit Day. The talk now of Europe possibly easing the pressure on London may be just because we're at a late stage in these talks and they do want to deal here. But equally, they do not want to see Theresa May toppled and replaced at the head of the Conservative Party with a hard Brexiter. And in this Parliament, they know who they fear. Thus far, the Prime Minister has stayed the course. I mean, there are moments when I thought she would not survive. I think the recent comments over the um, weekend by the former Foreign Secretary were distasteful as they were unhelpful. Is any of this enough to break the deadlock? Even the optimists recognise there is a tough road ahead. James Mates News at 10, Strasbourg. Now a little breaking news close to home. The European Research Group, the Tory Bro Brexit grouping, met today and Theresa May's leadership was on their agenda. Our political editor, Nick Watt, is there. I don't know why I sound so surprised when I said that, Nick, because fundamentally we've been expecting something like this. But tell us what you heard today. That's right. I mean, basically it was an open discussion at this meeting about how to get rid of Theresa May. Yeah. And um, talking to sources, they're saying that they, they've really never seen anything like it. There's this sort of open discussion. Then there were none of the niceties that you'd expect that Conservatives would have. Um, uh, one person I spoke to said that things are accelerating really rather quickly. Uh, and another said to me, uh, the mood really is hardening against the Prime Minister's uh, checkers plans for Brexit simply because it just would make the UK far too close to the EU. Now, this is not saying that the 48 signatures that are needed of Conservative MPs to trigger a confidence vote in Theresa May, not to say that's happening tomorrow, next week or any time soon, but, but one source I spoke to said that they'd heard that Theresa May was planning to say in her Tory conference speech at the beginning of October that she would like to lead the Conservative Party into the 2022 election. If she does that, I was told, she's finished. So this is all now out in the open. Clearly the PM will be more than aware of what's going on. Does this change her strategy with regards to Brexit checkers? The well, the Prime Minister and her Downing Street staff are absolutely adamant sticking to checkers. They say it is the only viable negotiation with the EU. It's the only document that has any hope of uh, being passed, maybe in an amended form, through Parliament. And uh, the Prime Minister's aides have been holding uh, dinners uh, with Eurosceptics. And uh, the message that was heard reportedly last night at the dinner was a warning that if they upset this, if they disrupt it, then John Burko might mm. manage to sort of manoeuvre things in Parliament so you'd find us having a second referendum. Big warning there. There was another dinner tonight, and I'm told that that dinner described to me as one of bloodbath. I spoke to somebody who said that they're comparing, these are the Eurosceptics, comparing Theresa May's determination to stick to checkers and how damaging that could be um, to the way that she handled the dementia tax uh, in the general election. Uh, and one Tory said to me, in that election, she nearly took the Conservative Party over the cliff. Yeah. And the way she's going about this, she could take the UK over the cliff. Nick, thanks very much.